you're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Hello, David. How are you? Hi, Blair. I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. I guess today we're talking about the new entrepreneur. Is that right? Yeah, the old entrepreneur. Yeah, let's talk about the new entrepreneur. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get right into it. The old, on, the old entrepreneur is dead. Entrepreneurs are passe. Um, you, so this is something you've been thinking about for a little while. I'm not sure if you've written on it yet. I know you've got ideas percolating on it and... Um, and you've got some, you, you're seeing some trends. I guess the first question I want to ask is, um, when did you start seeing some sort of pattern that led you to believe that kind of the nature of entrepreneurship is changing or the, the face of entrepreneurs is in some way changing? When did, what did you start to see and when? So th- this feels a little bit like a trap question, you know, like, cause if I say, I just saw it recently, then you're going to say, <laughs> well, why did it take you so long? And then if I say, yeah. oh, I saw it like eight years ago, then you're going to say, well, why did it take you long to articulate an intelligent thought about it? So what's the safe, how about if I say three years? How's that? That's a great answer. Okay. I wouldn't say any of those things in response. <laughs> I would think them absolutely, <laughs> but I know enough to keep them to myself. So Three years ago, you woke up and saw what? Well, it was in the context, interestingly, of other things. So, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, people are getting married later. They're having kids later. And they're maybe even graduating from college later and then doing something else before employment. And, and then it just carried over to start noticing what was happening with entrepreneurship in the field that both you and I serve, the, the creative field. And it was just interesting to see that. For, so it came up per, in particular because I do a lot of succession planning work. And so, you know, you have the principal who's the older party of the two, and then there's somebody else who's usually working for the principal already. And they want to tra- they both want to transfer the firm. And it occurred to me that these these the folks that were leaving were not as old as they used to. In other words, they weren't sticking along as as long as they had before. And also that there was an entrepreneur in their midst. So because we used to say, listen, if somebody is still working for you in their 30s, then they're not an entrepreneur. If they were, they would be off doing their own thing, right? But I don't think that's true anymore. It's kind of jumped up about 10 years, maybe. I don't have the data, but just, you know, just just looking around, it's it's obviously a little bit different. So the pattern is you're seeing people bailing out of owners exiting their firms a little bit younger and with more ready-made entrepreneurs already in their midst, ready and willing to take over? Yeah, exactly. So it, it's so it's like a baton, right? I mean, somebody has to give up the baton, but somebody has to be there to take it too. And so the, the principals who would who would be working for a long time and then they'd be done and, and they would move to Florida or, you know, I don't know where you folks move in Canada. Florida. Where do you move? You move to Florida We move too. to Florida. Yeah. God, that's before not we put me, the but, wall up. Yeah. But <laughs> once we get the wall up, you're not moving And you're going to make us pay for it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they would, you know, they would move, but now they're, they're not doing that. They're, they're ending earlier. They're handing it off to somebody and they're not assuming that this new hot, young entrepreneur is going to come from the outside and they're either going to buy the firm or they're going to start their own firm. It's, it's like not this, it's not this huge transition that it used to be. It's, uh, it's more of a moving in and out of entrepreneurship rather than some big decision that everybody is making and everybody congratulates the other person. And then when they're done with your entrepreneurship journey, everybody celebrates that too. It's just more of a nonchalant thing, it seems. Do you, are you saying that the line that separates an entrepreneur from uh, whatever a non-entrepreneur is, um, is, is blurrier? It's blurrier in the sense that it's less obvious to me that somebody's capable of running a business, but I don't think it's blurrier in one key aspect, and that's the the risk component. So in the true entrepreneur, you know, whatever that means, we maybe we should def- define that at mm-hmm. some point. But in, 
in the in the true entrepreneur's life there it, I actually did a study of 1340 principles surveyed them interviewed them and then gave each a personality profile and there was not a single common pattern in their personalities except for one thing and that was their aptitude for risk taking and I mm -hmm. don't see that that has not changed at all, but all the other things seem to have changed. So like if somebody's a certain age and before you might have written them off and said, ah, oh, they're not going to start a business. They're too old. That's not true anymore. And but that risk thing, I think, is still true. Hmm. So do you think, you know, if we were to define entrepreneur and we could look it up here, but what's your definition of entrepreneur and is it is your definition tied to propensity for risk? Yeah, I think it really is tied to risk. I feel very strongly about that, in fact. Uh, so when I use the word entrepreneur, what I mean, and I'm not saying this is what everybody should mean, but what I mean by it is that they see some unmet need in the marketplace and they do a little bit of research combined with some level of hunch and they take a financial risk, a significant financial risk to meet that need, and they figure it out along the way, which is different from other entrepreneurial types. In fact, like uh, you've known of principals who've decided to sell their firms to a key employee. And in some cases, it's easier for that key employee if they feel like they're inheriting a business that's run pretty well, the positioning's determined, the service offerings are there, we already have a staff, we already have client relationships. So it's easier for them. But in some cases, they really want to redo it and make it completely in their own image, to borrow a, a phrase somebody else said. I think it was God. I'm not sure. But they, mm -hmm. they want to do something completely their own. But what's what's unique is that these people are confident. They're optimists, they're risk takers, and they are not, they're, they, they're excited about changing the world in some unique way. Do, do, um, do you equate entrepreneurship with starting a business, running a business, or both? I mean, it, because um, the greatest risk, I would assume, and correct me if you disagree, is in starting the business, right? That's where you take the greatest amount of risk. And it's, it's far less risky to buy a going concern. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, like when you do start a business, though, your risk is, it's greater in the sense that you don't have a paycheck, but it's, it's not as great in other areas. Like you're not going to sign a very expensive 10-year facility lease until you've been up and running for a while. You're probably not going to borrow a ton of money. So in a sense, I think it's just a different kind of risk. Like if you're taking over a large business, it would seem like there's not as much risk there, but the purchase price is really significant. And the level, the monthly nut you've got to come up with just to meet payroll is substantial. So to me, I think we could maybe think about entrepreneurship on the flip side. Like what happens if an entrepreneur fails? That's what mm -hmm. defines an entrepreneur to me. And that failure is probably going to be personally embarrassing. It may hurt their credit history. Uh, their employees are going to be disappointed. Many of them will be without a job. So it feels like it's just slightly different. Um, but it's a different kind of risk, but it's still a very significant risk. Both kinds are. I, I was having a conversation at the beginning of this week with a client of mine who advises um, – uh, executive CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And he's a solo consultant. And he was saying, <clears throat> he was just telling me that he has to remind himself from time to time that it's a peer to peer relationship. He is the CEO of his business and he is working with the CEO of another business. And I pointed out that I, and it's, I, I'm not sure how valid this is, but I want to put it on the table for discussion. I pointed out, I said, yeah, you're a CEO and an entrepreneur. And a, and a lot of your clients are CEOs, but they are not entre entrepreneurs. Right. Um, because they didn't choose to start a business. Now, I, I'm not saying that they're lesser people or anything like that, but I'm just pointing out that I think there are, you know, there are CEOs of large companies who have never, it's not like they, they don't take huge amounts of risk every day, but it's career risk. It's not, it's not, they don't have everything on the line like an entrepreneur does, at least in the early days. 
Yeah. Is, is that an is that an important distinction? Like this idea that yeah, I've started the business versus I bought the business, and the profiles might be different. Absolutely, uh, and we can think about very specific companies where that seems to be the case, right? Steve Jobs maybe would mm-hmm. be a classic entrepreneur, but Tim Cook would be. I don't think we. It would hard. It's hard for us to picture Tim Cook rescuing Apple back then and having the guts and the you know the craziness yeah. to but but then maybe Tim Cook's better at running a larger company so yeah i think because a lot of like if Tim Cook fails what will what will failure look like well he'll still have 100 million dollars in the bank yeah. And that you know that that's it's hard for me to treat that seriously as failure. I I think you're exactly right, and I you know it, the people that you and I advise regularly or that go through your training programs, they're classic entrepreneurs running a small business. There's a pretty heavy price to pay if they fail. Some of them are moving to the corporate side when they get tired of the entrepreneurial fight. But you don't see as many people leaving the corporate side to start a firm like what I just described. They, you know, I, I'm. What I was saying at the at the earlier part of this is that those movements are a little bit older. But you know, so maybe somebody does it when they're 35 now, but they're still not doing it when they're 55. You know, there is something about this freewheeling high aptitude for risk <laughs> that that happens for entrepreneurship and and it's interesting to me like I think that apti- that's the risk thing is still there it's just different in that people are not making 30 year decisions now like they did before they're making a 5 or a 10 year decision they're starting when they're 35 instead of 25 and it's just it's just interesting it's opened up things for me like as I'm planning succession because I wouldn't necessarily rule somebody out now who comes in who's 40 years old and says I want to buy your agency I that just cuz they're 40 doesn't mean that wouldn't work like it would have meant in the past, I think. You, you would have previously thought, listen, if you're really an entrepreneur, you would have come to, you would have raised your hand before 30 or maybe yeah. before 30, before a certain age. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you suppose is driving this change? This, the fact that people are coming to entrepreneurship a little, a little bit later and there's a kind of a movement back and forth. Here I'm just guessing, but uh, LinkedIn did this really interesting study. They have all this data out there that's Man, you can do so much with it. Uh, one of the things they discovered is that people are making more money than they used to, not by getting raises where they're currently working, but by switching jobs. So it's like when I move from one team to the next, I'm going to get that second contract. I'm going to make more money. So we we live in a culture where everybody's changing jobs and they seem to be thriving, it's not hurting them. It's not hurting their careers. There isn't this stigma associated with bouncing around, this penalty for bouncing around. That's part of it, I think. Uh, The other is that folks are so much more in touch with themselves and they are they're more disgruntled with lack of transparency. They don't – they recognize bad behavior within companies quicker than they did before and they're willing to step out. Many f- – Families are two-income families as well, so it's not quite as risky if somebody does that. Those are just guesses about why it's happening. You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker of Recourses, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. Some of the, you know, the, the businesses that are being talked about these days, all, almost always in the same breath, Airbnb and Uber. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that those two businesses have in common, it's, it's essentially making entrepreneurs out of everyday people by selling their excess capacity, their excess kind of driving capacity with their car mm-hmm. or their excess bedrooms in their house. 
Um, is there, are you seeing that kind of part-time entrepreneurship rearing its head? Is there more of that going? Are we all, are we all kind of blurring the lines, uh, where we might have a day job, but we've all got something going on the side? Hmm. I don't see it in this industry yet. Uh, you still, you do see a lot more what we used to call freelancers. Now they want to be called independent contractors. You do see more of those folks who have, they're, they're not selling their time to 20 different entities in Dallas, say. They're now, they have more fixed gigs with three or four agencies and maybe it's 10 hours a week with one and 15 hours a week with somebody else. And that's driven in part because they don't want to go all the way away from that and start their own business and be responsible for all the management and all the new business and so on. They don't like the new business process, but they also don't want they they don't want the to give up the freedom that comes with work in working with somebody else. So they like moving in and out and they figured out a way to somehow allow that lifestyle to be defined as still successful for them. And they're making a lot of money as well. It's you know, if you're a great writer or a great digital media planner, um, a great strategist, well, you can make really good money and not go through the hassle of, of running and building your own firm. You could really have two or three clients. And that was the yeah. subject of Dan Pink's first book, right? Free Agent Nation. Right, exactly. I think um, you, while we're talking about entrepreneurs, this um, there is such a thing as a serial entrepreneur. And some would say that entrepreneurs are serial business starters. Um, other entrepreneurs just start one business and run that business for the rest of their careers. I like I have my opinion. It's not a strong it's I haven't kind of sorted it all through, but I have my opinion on this. But do, I wanted to ask you, do you these people who if you look at their LinkedIn profile or you look at some sort of written description of them, it says I've started and exited four businesses, started and sold four businesses. Mm -hmm. I always wonder you go look at the businesses they started. And you think, I've never heard of any of these. <laughs> you have to find them first, right? <laughs> yeah. They, they don't exist anymore, right? They were swallowed up by other entities. So I, my question is, are, are these people adding, and I suppose this is a bit of it. I don't mean to be judgmental, but I suppose there is some judgment behind this. Are these people really adding value in the world or are they spinning something spinning a top and then selling it. It's a bad metaphor, but are they, are they just spinning something up and exiting at the right time and leaving this trail of vapor behind them? <laughs> I'm getting a sense of how you feel about it. <laughs> that wasn't a very objective no, question. <laughs> no, well, the, fl the flip side of that is no, they're, you don't, the companies don't exist, but the technology or the IP that they developed is a very imp small but important part of the bigger entity that bought them or the entity that bought them, et cetera. So that's that would be the counter argument, I think. I just don't know yeah. what's really going on. Do you have an opinion? I do. I'm, you know, we we all have some family member that comes to reunions, and you know, you almost hesitate to ask what they're up to now because you know it's they're going to answer it differently than they did just you know this is Christmas and they answered it differently than Thanksgiving, but, but with just as much enthusiasm, <laughs> right? And an opportunity to invest if you're interested, <laughs> and. You know, those those kind of folks, I just kind of roll my eyes and it's like, just settle down and get a job and contribute to the world and quit trying to find easy ways around things. And then then I know, well, my um, my one of my son's father in laws is one who really is a serial entrepreneur and has been wildly successful at everything he's done. And they haven't been all closely related. And I look at people like that and I. I'm just amazed at, and I know the exit stories and they're real, right? So when I, when somebody tells me that my, I get red flags, they just kind of pop up. And, and what I want to know is, okay, did you get bought, accidentally bought during one of those, those crazy markets where uh, things were happening that just shouldn't have? Um, or when we look into the story a little bit more closely, was it really an acqui hire? 
which is a term that didn't even exist back then. But it, but basically, you know, they they fold you into their company. You didn't get any money for it, or if you did, it was fifty thousand dollars. You know, I'm really skeptical about those sorts of claims. I do know very very successful serial entrepreneurs, but it seems like they're in the minority, and they're the ones that don't talk too much about it. <laughs> it's yeah. the ones that are always talking about it that I'm leery of. You, you kind of when somebody says I started and exited four companies, you you want to say okay, just stop and show me the numbers so I can know how <laughs> how to how to gauge how to measure what you've just said. Yeah, right. And we've got it. Uh, you and I have joked uh, at times about how there are so many experts around, and and I think we're we're many folks are really trying to inflate sort of the resume and talk about this, hoping that people won't ask too many questions about it. I'm sure I never did any of that years ago. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, me yeah. as well. <laughs> I've heard you say that another pattern that you've noticed that um, that running a creative firm is no longer a life sentence. Hmm. What do you mean by that? It's like pe- people's, and maybe you've already addressed this, but are you saying that it's not you go in, you 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 do your life's work, you sell, you move to Florida at the end. If it's not a life sentence, what are these people doing after they exit a little bit earlier? Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, if you if you look at at the educational preparation that these entrepreneurs had, very little of it matches what they're doing and for their business. So in some cases, you know, they're free to do anything they want because there isn't a strong tie between their vocation and their education anyway, and they're also, um, you, you know, they're they're leaving because. I th- I think if there's one larger reason why they're leaving is because they're disillusioned with the marketing field, honestly. And they frequently, if there's a pattern there in terms of what specifically they get tired of first, it's not so much the principles of marketing that they're selling. It's the poor client behavior. They get tired of clients. And then it, the next step is frequently they get tired of employees. The other factor is that uh, exits like it's okay to have an orderly closure of a business and that does not signal failure in our world like it used to there there was no good explanation for a business closing in the creative field up until recently and nowadays we understand it it's like oh okay um, you had a great run. You had an impact on clients and on employees, and you made a living, and you've decided to do something else. No problem. You didn't find a buyer. Too bad, but that's okay. So it just means that people have a lot more options. Now, what are they doing when they leave? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I have seen some crazy stories. A lot of them are going into you know, very non-traditional things like they're shoveling wolf shit in Utah, like one of my clients, <laughs> uh, you know, they're it, some conservation kind of a thing. Um, many of them are consultants to the field. Uh, some are teaching. There seems to be a pretty close connection between running a firm and teaching, having an impact on on kids in an educational environment. Uh, some of them have made enough money that they don't have to do anything else. They 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 built a firm in the right way and they sold it at the right time and and ten million is enough. A lot of my clients, I've told them to plan on taking all the money they make as the money they take out every year. We've aimed for a target. They'll go for six, eight, ten million, and when they hit that and they're young fifties, then they're ready to do something else. And then we either transition to the firm or we don't. It doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah, I am seeing the pattern. I there's there's a quite a highly regarded UX firm a couple of years ago just shut it down and went to work for Facebook. Quite a like and all all uh, it left the industry talking about it quite a bit. But it was just a really well regarded, really successful, excellent work. Just decided, you know what? It's going to be difficult to scale beyond where we are right now. We kind of built the company for this mm. size. We're ready yeah. for the next challenge. We're not structured to do things differently. Let's just shut it down, call it a day, and go to you know at a time when they were the principals received a great offer from a, another large, exciting company. Why not? Like Adaptive Path uh, got bought by Capital One two years ago. Same story. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and they were a very famous, well-regarded firm running two conferences, and it just the time was right. They that the in-house department for one thing more people are working in-house departments than are working independent firms. 
now, and they're not the enemy like they used to be. And they're, they also have a great benefit structure. They don't bring the new business um, uh, pressure that some people don't like and so on. So why not? Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes here uh, before we wrap up. Just you you and I were talking before we started about kind of the relationship between entrepreneurship and fr- franchisees and maybe a little bit of a blurring of the lines there. Um, did you want to talk about that at all? It's interesting to see it's not quite in the category of a quick rich scheme, but you do find folks who are not the wild off-road vehicle entrepreneurs that want to create something from nothing. You do find a different kind of entrepreneur that really wants to borrow a system almost like a franchise. So what a franchise does is I think of it as like a middle ground of entrepreneurship. I don't mean to disparage their level of entrepreneurship because they're taking a massive risk and they are doing it within an environment with less control, which I think is really admirable. But an entre- uh, but uh, you know, a franchise gives somebody a system. It's a proven system. If you buy a McDonald's for a million and a half dollars, then you know where you're going to get your food. You know what the recipes are. You know exactly what the co-op dollars are. You know what you're going to have to pay the mothership for for that marketing help and so Follow on. Follow the manual and everything will be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And which sometimes is true. <laughs> and yeah. and so there there are. When, you know, when when the word world became more digital and we felt like we were going to be able to track what was happening in the marketing world because of all of this, there was this sense that a lot of what we were going to do was be going to become more automatic. And so you have some systems out there that help people like – and you'll see the ads for it basically we'll we'll tell you how to do it here's how you make money we'll provide the support systems you only need six thousand dollars to start and meanwhile you can do it and you know i i think there is a place for that but it's very hard to combine that like that sort of a system is going to be just completely frowned on by the typical entrepreneur who resists systems. They they see a great system and they don't care how great it is. Their first instinct is how do I change it, right? And so they're it's it's just it's a different it's, it's a different world that those systems are appealing to. Now, I'm tempted to ask this question about your kids, but you you have older kids. You were you are a very young father and you're a young grandfather, obviously the grandfather of some very young children. If you had to look forward into their future and make a make a prediction about what how likely they are to be entrepreneurs in some form, do you think it's higher or lower than it would be today? Hmm. I think it's pretty high, but I th- I think there's two reasons for that. One is that they're both risk takers by nature. They take risks differently between the two of them, two boys in their young 30s. The other is that they grew up in a household where I was doing that. And so, you know, they were sitting in the office while I was on the phone listening to my side of the conversation. They were attending the seminars I was doing. And so it took a lot of the mystique out of it. It it made it seem very comfortable and doable when they had a father as an entrepreneur. And my dad was not a classic entrepreneur, but he had an entrepreneur's mind. And I feel like I learned so much about that risk taking from him as well. Hmm. All right. So we're moving into a more entrepreneurial world. Thank you for this, David. This is yeah, fascinating. Great, great. Good to talk to you, Blair. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Two Bobs with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com. That's the number two, B-O-B-S.com.